Hey there, Will here from Ships Have Sailed, and welcome to the second episode of Color Commentary. Now, if you've read the title of this video, you might be thinking to yourself, man, this is just an episode full of shameless self-promotion. And I'm here to admit to you that you are actually right. Sort of. Uh, it's true. I make music. So I sell music, and so this topic is very relevant to me personally, but it's also relevant to every single other artist in the music industry, even the ones who are signed. And if you, as a music lover, wants artists to keep creating the music that you listen to, it's also relevant to you as well. So I'm here to explain briefly why buying music is still important. In a nutshell, while streaming is still a really cool way for consumers like you to enjoy music, it still isn't a great way for artists like me to get paid for what we're creating. Take iTunes, for example. If you round the price of a song up to an even dollar, iTunes takes 30% of that, gives the artist, assuming you're independent and own all your rights, 70%, which is precisely 70 cents a song. Easy and transparent, right? And even though 70 cents isn't a lot, you can earn back the money it takes to record, mix, master, and market a single if you sell around a thousand units. Disclaimer, making high quality music is not cheap. So on one hand, we have iTunes. Streaming services, on the other hand, wind up paying less than 0.007 cents per stream. Some pay a tiny bit more, some much less. Just to put it in perspective, a song would need to be streamed 1 million times in order to generate almost as much revenue as 1,000 downloads. It's also pretty fuzzy as to how these payments are calculated. But why, you might ask, is the amount paid to artists so different between streaming and sales? Well, really quickly, I'm gonna try to explain. Simply put, the laws have not quite caught up with the technology yet. When money is paid to a streaming service, either through a premium subscriber or an advertiser, it gets added to their balance sheet first, and then they deduct salaries, bonuses, expenses, etc., and all of that gets deducted from their adjusted income before the artist's split is calculated. That means they're paying their executives, all company employees, paying for their offices, operating expenses, and probably a whole bunch of corporate parties and events before the artist gets their cut. And of course the artists have no say or visibility into any of these costs, why would they? Although I do happen to know that the average Spotify executive makes 1.34 million per year, and the average employee makes about 168,000. It's worth noting that both of these numbers are much, much more than your average artist earns. Okay, so I don't want to bash streaming services. I actually am a big fan of Spotify in particular. They have awesome tools that they provide to artists like me so that I can see and connect with the folks who are enjoying my music on their platform. And I feel like they're truly trying to become an artist discovery channel, which is something that iTunes just isn't. But with that said, I do think that the operating model needs to change, and it's probably going to take many years of legislation to do that. In the meantime, while we wait for a solution, if you love that new single or album that your favorite artist just released, consider supporting them by purchasing it from your favorite retailer, and maybe leave a rating or a nice review while you're at it. One of my personal favorite things to do is read the reviews on a release as they come in. It helps us to know what we're doing right, and also what we can improve on for next time. And finally, getting back to where we all started, which was shameless self-promotion, I've left some links to a few of my favorite releases of ours in the description of this video. I'd love for you to explore our catalog if you haven't already, and maybe consider making a purchase. No pressure, though. See you next time.